Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike McCarran, and I'm the chairperson of Apex Scotland. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for what, in fact, will be the ninth Apex Scotland annual lecture since we relaunched it in 2003. As you know, the lecture is intended to offer a platform for debate about any aspect of our criminal justice system as it currently operates and might develop in the future. That's it. it is firmly established now as a key event in the criminal justice calendar is evident from, by the many of you who are here this evening, key players from all sectors of criminal justice, education and beyond. And as in previous years, we will be publishing a transcript of the lecture and it will be available on our website very soon. And also we're doing an audio recording that will be posted there too. Each year, we've been very fortunate to secure a high caliber of speaker, and this year is no exception, with our speaker for the evening being Tam Bailey, Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People. We thought it would be appropriate for Tam to be formally introduced to you by a young person from uh, the innovative Apex Scotland Inclusion Unit in Dunfermline High School, and I'm going to hand over to the fourth year pupil, Chloe Duncan, in a few moments to formally do that. Um, but just first of all, a few words to say, I've had a long involvement myself with Apex Scotland, uh, having been on the board since 2001. And I've been very privileged to see at first hand the very significant work which is carried out by our staff for people who come to us for support. And also by the effectiveness and efficiency in the services which are provided. And you'll see some examples of that in the 2011 annual report, which you have been given and which I'm officially launching this evening. One of the services featured in the annual report is in fact the inclusion unit in Dunfermline High School. And I'm delighted to say that tonight, uh, it is represented by Chloe, Chloe Duncan uh, and Dean Cooper uh, who are fourth year pupils, and by Connor Brogan, who is in the third year. I'm pleased also that uh, the school's rector, Brian Blanchflower, and the deputy director, Louise Ramsey, are here too. You're all extremely welcome. There's more information about the inclusion unit in your delegate packs, and you'll have a chance to talk to the pupils and staff after the lecture. But I would suggest that this initiative is not only an excellent example of really good partnership working, but it's also, in its remarkable success, uh, proof of the value of investing in preventative services if we want to realize the potential of young people and also avoid costly expenditure in the future. This was, of course, one of the key recommendations of the Christie Commission report. Apex Scotland is very keen to expand its activities in this area and currently we're talking to a number of schools about the possibilities of doing this. I just want to say a word about our sponsor for this evening, Mega Nexus. Mega Nexus designed and implemented uh, our AIM Hire management information database earlier this year. This not only allows us to maintain accurate and secure client details, but also very importantly, enables our partners to directly refer clients to Apex Scotland and also enables our clients to chart, to chart their own personal progress uh, in relationship to the positive future wheel, uh, which I think they find very, very uh, gratifying. This has made a huge difference to the effectiveness of our services and I'd like to thank very much the staff of Mega Nexus, some of whom have joined us this evening, both for their commitment and also for their support uh, for tonight's event. And now, Chloe, I'd like to hand over to you to introduce tonight's speak, speak, speaker for the 2011 Apex Scotland Annual Lecture. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chloe Duncan and I'm a fourth year pupil at Dunfermline High School in Fife. I have worked with Apex Scotland Inclusion Unit since my first year of high school and during this time I've learned many new things about myself and the potential to achieve things I want in life. 
I've learned respect and trust, and it has to be earned, and it can't be taken for granted or assumed lightly. Working with the Inclusion Unit opened up opportunities for me, including visits to organisations, being presented for award, and recognised as a peer mentor within the school. However, one of the most recent highlights for me was inviting Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People into our school after hearing about his Right Big Blether campaign and asking him to take part in a discussion about his work for us. This fitted in really well with what we do in the inclusion, as we are free to talk about issues that affect us and how to deal with them in the best way. We felt the Commissioner talked openly and honest with us and to answer all our questions about how he, about how he works for us, and we did have a Right Big Blether. After getting along with so, well for, so well with him, we, all, we thought we would ask him another favour and ask him to come to our, our this year's Apex annual lecture. Once again, he kindly agreed. Therefore, without delay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Commissioner for Children and Young People, Tam Bailey. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chloe. Oh, that's quite loud. Uh, I'm going to stand here. The stage is a little bit far away, uh, and I know I'm quite small, so it'll make it even more challenging for you. So I'll try and move around to make sure that people can actually uh, see me as I speak. And I, I want to start by saying what a privilege it is for me to be Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People. And the reason I say that is that I spent the better part of 30 years working with children and young people. And the opportunity to be able to use that experience and this position to try and change and improve the lives of children and young people in Scotland is just an absolute honour. And it's a privilege to be able to speak to you here tonight as people who have influence, people who've got an interest, an inclination, and I think a passion for doing the same in terms of improving the lives of children and young people. And that's how I describe my role when I go to schools, when I go to uh, social care settings, when I go to youth club settings, speaking to children and young people, I try and find the simplest way that I can to describe the job that I'm doing. And I want to tonight tell you about how I'm setting out my stall in terms of the work that I'm doing, because I think it sets the context for why I'm speaking to you tonight and addressing you about how we treat children and young people. And the most important document for me is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UNCRC, the UNCRC that we in the UK have signed up to, to say that we will do the very best by our children and young people. We will hold ourselves to account in terms of the rights that are laid out in UNCRC, and we'll honour those obligations to our children and young people throughout their childhood. And we'll subject ourselves to periodic uh, monitoring and scrutiny by the UN committee and in fact that's part of the reason that we have a position such as Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People because I'm part of the scrutiny of how well are we doing by our children and young people how well are we genuinely honouring the rights and the articles as laid out in UNCRC so what I want to do tonight is to tell you how I'm going to go about doing that uh, task that role. I'm going to give you some idea of my strategic aims and objectives. I want to give you some idea of my contact, I, my experience of the children's hearing system, and I want to speak about children at the tail end of their experiences of the children's hearing system, and make some suggestions and prompt some thinking amongst yourselves, and to try and actually move in a positive way about how we treat our children and young people. I've got three strategic aims. The first of those is about participation in education. Participation in terms of listening and hearing the voices of children and young people. And I say hearing because we're actually quite good a lot of the time at listening, but hearing and acting on what children and young people tell us. So I spent the better part of a year and a half, producing resources for schools, prompting teachers, youth workers, care workers to conduct exercises, workshops about the UNCRC, to make sure that in the build-up to 
uh, an exercise which we called a right blether. And a right blether was about me conducting a consultation with children and young people about the things that were important to them. And in fact, I couldn't say it too publicly, but the ambition was that a right blether would be the biggest consultation that we'd ever undertaken in Scotland. And that meant that it had to top 51,000 responses, because that was the number of responses that we had to our consultation on the banning of smoking in public places. So throughout that year and a half, there were lots and lots of activity in schools and youth clubs and social care settings to prompt uh, people's awareness, people's thinking about UNCRC, about the commissioner. And then that, that finally uh, uh, culminated in a vote on the, the issues that were important to children and young people. And it's from a right blether that I'm going to be, conduct, or I'm going to be putting together my strategic plan. That makes it sound very grand, but that my strategic plan, which is going to be the programme of work that I'll conduct over the next four stroke five years. And I'll give you some idea of what's in that as I talk tonight. But that's one really critical issue about listening to the views of children and young people. And I know that there's been a lot of time and energy in the latest deliberations on the children's hearing system about how effectively we capture the voice and the views of children who are going through that system. And I welcome that agonizing, that attempt to try and make sure that those voices are actually heard throughout that, system, or throughout that process. So that's one strategic aim. The second one that I have is about awareness and understanding of the UNCRC. Part of that is uh, achieved through some of the exercises that we've been working through in terms of professionals. But my main objective there is really to shift the value base that we have for our children and young people. And the way that I characterize that is the feeling of the sense of outrage that we all experience when children, for instance, die at the hands of their carers, and the shame that we as a society take on board and try and learn the lessons and for it not to happen again. And I compare that to the reaction when children in later years commit offences, commit serious offences, dangerous offences, offences which disturb ourselves. And I contrast the reaction to that because many times the outrage is about the outrage of those children. And yet, for me, those children are often the children who have actually survived their traumatised experiences in their early childhood. And the UNCRC, the reason that's so important is because this is about rights and the way that we treat children right the way through their childhood. That our children right the way through to 18 years of age. And I want us to have a more even approach, a more even value in all of our children, right the way through their childhood, regardless of their actions, regardless of how they may have transgressed, regardless of how disturbed we are at the children's behaviour. And I think that by looking at UNCRC, we can help or help ourselves have that value base right the way through their childhood. And the third area which I have got as a strategic aim is about protecting and safeguarding children's rights. And because of my experience, because I've been working throughout my life with children who are vulnerable, children who are on the edge a lot of the time, then I intend to do that through our most vulnerable groups. And in Scotland, we're living in a society where we've got 55,000 children estimated who are living with substance misusing parents. 65,000 estimated who are living with drug misusing parents. And somewhere in the region of 100,000 who may be living with domestic abuse. These are really challenging figures. And the challenge here is how do we narrow down to the vulnerable groups, or how do I narrow down to the vulnerable groups that I'm going to be working on? because I've got limited resources. And I want to find those areas where I can make most, give most added value. 
And in fact, from a right blether, children told us that they wanted to be safe and secure in their homes. My interpretation on that is about the prevention of abuse and neglect. And to further refine that, I'm going to be concentrating and working on those children that are affected and living with domestic abuse. They also told us that they wanted to be included, no matter how different we all are. And my initial response to that is to look at children with disabilities. But when we went back to children and young people, they said, that's all children. And just working with children with disabilities is too narrow. So I'm looking at ways of how we work with a number of different groups. And incidentally, on the value of children and young people in society, uh, when I was talking there about uh, I, how children uh, can be demonized through offending and through their, uh, uh, the, the reaction that we have to, children time and time again told us that they didn't feel valued and respected. And in fact, I'm going to be campaigning on that once we get the staff in place that can attend to that. So lots of the things that I'm mentioning are tonight, the things that I want to be working on, that we will be working on, have derived directly from a right blether. And that's participation in education, uh, um, awareness and understanding of UNCRC, and protecting and safeguarding rights. But even if we get all those right, for me there's three overarching issues that we, will, we have to get right if we're going to be uh, nurturing our children to become the responsible adults that we want them to. And the first of those is about the impact of the cuts. I'm not going to go on at length about it, but we have to make sure that our children's services do not suffer disproportionately, as they have done previously, as they did do during the 80s when we went through the last recession, as our child poverty figures rose exponentially and steeper than any other country in Europe. And that's the second overarching issue, it's about child poverty. Child poverty that has the most corrosive impact on our children's well-being as they grow up, on our children's capacity to realise their rights throughout their childhood. And the third overarching issue is about early years. Early years where the government has done a good job in laying out the argument, laying out the research that tells us the earliest years of children's lives are the most important in terms of attachment, in terms of those children developing resilience in their later years so that they can, so that they can navigate and negotiate their way through childhood. And I'm pleased that the government are now talking in terms of how they might be much more assertive in bringing the early years framework to life. And I welcome that and I look forward to some of the discussions on that. So those overarching issues, if we don't tackle those, then we will be forever having to have compensatory services in terms of our children and young people. And of course, in amongst all of that, we've got children who are identified as our most vulnerable children. Children who become looked after. Children for whom we, as the state, say that we have to intervene, we have to provide support to those children. And in fact, I started my first contact with the children's hearing system was in 1979. 1979, where it was a relatively young system, but I didn't know that at the time. And I was as green as the grass. And I didn't know that how enlightened it was to be looking at a child's needs in the round, to be taking account of their family life, to be taking account of their education uh, uh, needs, of their health needs. And in fact, I was called, and my title at the time was an intermediate treatment worker intermediate treatment and it was borrowed from England and it was intermediate between home and care and treatment because they needed some input and a number of HP agreements that I've signed as an IT worker where they thought I worked in computers <laughs> it's not worth speaking about uh, but anyway so I was an IT worker in Scotland and I moved to England and one of my first experiences of England was working with a young man we'll call him Darren and Darren this is in the early 80s Darren received a detention centre order, a DC order, 10 weeks uh, through the English courts. And his mum said to me, she said, Tam, could we, uh, could we go and visit uh, Dad? And I said, of course you can, I'll take you. Uh, and so we went to Oxford, Kid Kidlington, Kidlington DC, big long avenue, and at the bottom of it, 10 foot high fence, barbed wire, 
We got inside. Darren is in his uh, blues, his stripy shirt, and his blue trousers. This is a 14-year-old who had gone in one shoplifting spree too many. And that stuck with me. It stuck with me in the contrast to the system that I'd just left in Scotland, where we would never have that approach under a children's hearing system. And then I moved to Liverpool, by which time I was spending a lot of time in the courts, a lot of time in the juvenile courts in Liverpool, Bootle Court, as it turned out. And it struck me the, number of, the, the amount of time and energy that went in to establishing whether children had committed an offence or not. And how little time was spent considering what should we do about it. And in fact, it was complete contrast to my experience of the children's hearing system, where they actually dealt very quickly with whatever the grounds of referral were or acceptance, except if it went for proof, and a very long time trying to get to the bottom of how they would assist and how they would deal with this child, this family before them. And it was almost a complete mirror image. 80-20 rule I used to go for. 80% of the time in England trying to establish whether they'd done it or not, 20% about what to do about it. And the mirror image in Scotland, 20-80. So it stuck with me. And I've got a great affinity with our hearing system. And in fact, I get the privilege of uh, meeting other commissioners. We've got a commissioner, children's commissioner for England, Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. And from time to time, we make statements. It can be a bit tricky getting four commissioners to agree on a joint statement. Most recently, we were putting one together on juvenile justice. And the statement had bits in it, or elements to it, which were about not focusing just on the criminal behavior, about taking account of the family life, education, health needs. And we put it together. And I said, well, actually, that's not so radical in terms of the system that I'm coming from. And they said, well, that's great, Tam, because what we can do is that we can look to the Scottish system, look at the evidence of the impact that the Scottish system has on children and young people, and we'll use that as part of the backup for this, communica this communication in terms of juvenile justice. And I had to look rather sheepishly at them to say, well, in all honesty, the research base is rather thin. And the evidence of better outcomes for our children from the children's hearing system is actually rather thin as well. And in fact, some of the evidence that's currently been produced is indicating a rather worrying trend in terms of not having terribly much impact on children and young people in terms of their progress through the system. So I'm saying this as a real believer in the system, but I do think there are challenges that we have to look at in terms of producing the evidence about the, the genuine impact that it has on our children and young people. And I'm saying that also from somebody that's got a great affinity and a great belief in the ethos of the children's hearing system. And I'm just going to say a little bit more about where I think some of the other weaknesses are in the system right now. And I've been very supportive of the, uh, the establishment of the children's hearing system, national convener, and all of those developments which I hope will actually result in a more effective system. But there are still some challenges here about the authority of the panel decision, about how effectively that would be put into uh, place in terms of the, um, the response from the local areas to following the panel recommendations. And the two areas where I think there is still concern is about the age of criminal responsibility, which sits at eight. The government should be given credit for taking our under 12s out of the adult court system. They should also be given credit for the decoupling of the link with the criminal consequences in terms of a criminal career following a child right the way through their childhood and beyond, although it's still there for serious offences and it's still there for DNA retention. But we've still got an age of criminal responsibility at age eight. And I mentioned the periodic scrutiny that the UN brings to countries who've signed up to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I can write the concluding observations right now, the next time we are subject to that scrutiny in 2014, and it will have a section in it which is about the need 
to look at a higher age of criminal responsibility for our children in Scotland. It's just sticking there is something which we have to actually deal with. The other thing about age, of course, is our 16 and 17 year olds. Our 16 and 17 year olds who we, I'll say a general comment about 16, 17 year olds, but 16, 17 year olds in the hearing system who we can't make our minds up whether they're dealt with through the hearing system or through the adult courts. And I'm going to say something general about 16, 17 year olds, because these are children, these are young people who are caught between two systems most often, a child care system and an adult care system. A juvenile justice system, most often, in terms of the children's hearing system, and an adult criminal justice system. Health services, mental health services, which, depending on what bit of the country you're in, it stops at 16 or 17 or 18. And most importantly, a time where children are moving from school into further education or training or employment. There are so many of our systems that there's a fracture at age 16 and 17. And we have to address that societally, but we also have to look at the impact that that has on children that are going through a children's hearing system. And I'm going to give you another story just now. For many years, I worked in Glasgow in the city centre doing street work. Some of the most traumatising experiences for me in terms of the circumstances that young people find themselves. And it was a young woman, I'll call her Angie. And Angie was on the streets. Angie was estranged from her family. She was age 17. She had been in care, gone back home, and it had broken down. Quite a familiar story, but they'd kept her. She was still in supervision. She was still under the auspices of the social work department. And we were in touch with the social work department to say, keep her on supervision, because we're going to need those resources, that tech, the, the support, and we'll do what we can from the street. And we did. And we did lots of work with Angie. She was associating with people who were quite, I think, potentially dangerous to her. She was in the edge of prostitution, being sexually exploited. We were concerned about Angie. And in fact, she was getting appearances in the court. And in fact, it resulted in a hearing, a hearing where the panel decided that Angie needed secure accommodation. That was unexpected. We didn't expect that result. And I'm not, I'm not telling this story to, to, to pass judgment or otherwise on the panel decision. But the thing that struck me is I went to see Angie in secure accommodation because we knew she would come back. And the first thing she said was, you and your effing panel system because I could have had 28 day lie-in and be shot at you. Now I'm stuck here, and I don't know when I'm going to get out. Now the reason I'm telling you that is because I think there's ambivalence that has been within the hearing system about how do we deal with that older age group, that 16, 17 year old age group. And I think it's very significant that during the passage of the bill, the most recent bill, that there was very little, if any, debate about 16 and 17 year olds. There was in fact no serious proposal about the hearing system being extended to cope with 16 and 17 year olds. And I'll give you another example. And many moons ago, I opened a, a direct access hostel for homeless people in Glasgow. And this was this was seen as a jewel in the crown for Glasgow, which had very progressive housing policies at that time. So progressive, in fact, some housing authorities used to send their 16, 17 year olds into Glasgow. But anyway, it, they had progressive housing policies, and this was their short term, immediate pickup, direct access for 16 to 21 year olds, dealing with the most vulnerable children and young people. And of course, there's a very high population of 16, 17 year olds. But the key thing was, two key things, we had about seven or eight times the referrals for that unit than we could accommodate. And 50% of them were children from care, 50%. And we, of course, were knocking on the door of social work and saying, you have to do something about these children, these young people that are leaving care. 
And so I had the privilege just a year ago of speaking at the launch of the residential care initiative to rejuvenate our uh, residential care. And I was asked to give a short input and I thought, I'll phone up Stopover. I didn't want to speak to the manager, but I said, can I speak to the manager? And I said to her, I said, I just want to ask you a simple question. How many of your residents come from care? And she said, 50%. So in the 24, 25 years, that unit was still providing the same, for the same client group, but it wasn't a care unit, it's a homeless unit. So we still had that same pattern of children leaving care, going back for short periods of time, breakdown, and finding themselves in the homeless system. And in fact, Audit Scotland recently, just last year, produced a report on care. And were very critical of local authorities because they couldn't quantify or they couldn't demonstrate the value for money about the enormous sums of money that they were paying out for youngsters to be accommodated in care. But the thing that struck me is the annex to that, that report, they could list 29 reports about children who were in or leaving care. And in fact, if you add that one to that's 30 reports. We are not short in rhetoric about children in care or children leaving care, and yet we are still sitting in the same position with those children in terms of accommodation. And I've not come along tonight, but if you choose to look at their educational attainment, it's still the same. We've got a bit, a bit better, or we've got a much more sophisticated idea about the differences between different types of care, but it's still very poor educational outcomes for those children and young people. So there's an issue there about our children leaving care. And just one last story on this one. As part of a right blether, I visited Pullman twice and Cotton Vale. And I was busy explaining my role to the, the young people there. And I said, I'm, my responsibility in terms of UNCRC is for all children 18 and under. But if you've been in care, then I've got responsibilities up to age 21. And that fits with the responsibilities that our local authorities carry, or powers that you carry with regard to children in care. And I said, so how many of you have been in care? A whole forest of hands. I didn't bother counting them. But an enormous, a, a very high proportion of those people who were in Cottonville and Pullman care backgrounds. And if you look at the stats on it, it's somewhere between 45 and 70 percent. It depends because we don't actually routinely count them. Although I think SPS are looking at trying to get a much better and more consistent understanding of the number of youngsters that are in those establishments who've got care backgrounds. So for me, there's a very big issue here about our care youngsters becoming part of our criminal justice system. And some of that is evidenced through a longitudinal study, the Edinburgh Longitudinal Study of Youth Transitions and Crime. And one of the findings, one of the facts that they talk about is that children who are in the system find that they stay in the system for long periods of time. And in fact, when they move on from the children's hearing system, they find themselves propelled through into our justice system, into our YOIs. And that, again, is an issue about how well are we caring for that most vulnerable group of children and young people. So, I'm painting a picture here just now where I have a great affinity and a great deal of respect for our hearing system. It's borne out by my early experiences. It's not without its uh, challenges, things that it may be looking at in terms of where it could make improvements. And there are certainly issues for me with that transition from the children's hearing system into our adult systems. And I want to now turn to some of the things that we might consider in terms of improving that. And I'm coming from a starting point of 16 and 17 year olds in custody. And I don't think that we should be looking at custody 
for a 16, 17 year old. And I think there are some very encouraging signs about whole system approaches which look at within our existing system trying to provide the right packages of support on a multi-agency basis. And in fact, it may well be that the dent in our young offenders figures are a result of that. They're looking at 16, 17 year olds and that's really encouraging. And I think we should continue to develop that whole systems approach for those 16, 17 year olds. But I also think that we should be looking at alternatives to custody. And that means that some of those youngsters will be under, uh, will be removed from the community. And the reason that I mention that is because I think we have to look at it in terms of a security state. A security state which fluctuates in terms of the population. And in fact, when I looked at the figures, coincidentally, recently, uh, when I looked at the figures of the number of uh, young people aged 16 and 17 year old in custody, we had in the female side, and we're very concerned about what happens to our, female, our, our young uh, female offenders. There were no 16 year olds, and there were seven aged 17. And I looked at around about the same time for our secure accommodation figures, and there were seven vacancies. Now, I'm not for a minute suggesting that we move those seven who are in custody to secure accommodation, but I am suggesting that we should have a discussion that includes both our youth custody and our issues with youth custody and looking at our secure estate. And albeit that there are real problems with the secure estate because it's overly burdened by capital costs and all sorts of uh, resource issues. But I think we can achieve something real about the combination of community support and alternatives to using youth custody for our 16, 17 year olds. And just to continue on that vein about, I talked a lot about processes tonight. And sorry, I should say that the, 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 that idea is not mine. That actually was one of the proposals that came from the McLeish Commission when we were looking at the, how we should reshape and rethink our approach to imprisonment. And that's one of the recommendations uh, that was mooted at that point. And another one of those recommendations was dealing with this business of the ambivalence of, uh, or my perceived ambivalence within the hearing system about dealing with 16, 17 year olds. Some people feel very strongly about the extension of 16, 17 year olds. Others are not as convinced, partly on resource issues, but also I think it brings in a whole heap of other issues. And one of the implications that the McLeish Commission again made was about looking at specialist youth hearings for 16, 17 year olds. Well, given what I've said earlier about that care population who are in our YOIs, I would take that a stage further and say that if we are serious about how we are going to tackle some of our young offender issues that the youth hearings could justly be thought of at age 16 to 21. And I throw that there as to stimulate some thinking and some thoughts on that. And the final thing that I want to say is back to the youngsters in care. We don't need to legislate on this. We are turning out youngsters from care at far too young an age. And for anybody in this audience that is a parent, then think of the age at which your child left home, your children left home, or rather may still be at home, as one of my children is still at home. But they're not 16 or 17, they're in their 20s, because the average age of children leaving home is in their mid-20s. So why are we, as a society, turning out children from care, our most vulnerable children, at age 16, 17, 18, 19, if you're lucky, and put them in what we euphemistically call independent accommodation units. And now, if you combine that with what we know about children who are part of the, the hearing system and the chances of them ending up in custody, then in, some res well, in many respects, we are just not honoring our responsibilities to that group of children and young people. And we have to be much more assertive about how we care for our children and young people over the long term. There are push factors that in terms of youngsters leaving care. Often that is about other youngsters coming through. Often that's about a culture of 
it's time for you to move on. But there are pull factors as well, because we have to be looking at age-appropriate care. We have to make it attractive for these young people to stay in the accommodation units or the kind of care that we should be providing for them. So that's my three things for people to think about. And I say that as people here who have influence, who can actually, I think, exert some change. To think about the 16, 17 year olds use of custody, to think about that crossover from hearing system to adult system and looking at the recommendation in terms of youth hearings and certainly for us to be much more, I would say, assertive, much more um, diligent about our longer term care needs to children who have already been identified as within the system. And I want to end with uh, another story, another anecdote. And some years ago, myself and my daughter, who was still at home at that time, I think she was in her mid-twenties, by the way, um, I, we were doing the messages in the local supermarket. And there's a big long line of uh, um, tills. And there's a, a young man and a young woman who are marching all the way down these. And I caught myself staring at the man because he had a really badly scarred face. Really badly scarred. And it caught my eye. And I caught, well, I, it caught my eye and I caught myself staring at him. And a young woman with him caught me staring at this man. And she stopped. And she came right up to me, right up to my face. I'm shaking by this time. And she said, you're Tam. And I said, oh. <laughs> and she said, I'm Angie. And then Angie told me her story. Now she was about 12, 13 years between the last contact I had. And I have to say, when Angie came back out of Secure, we did work with her, but we lost contact. Her life was all over the place. And the first thing I said to Angie was, thank God you're alive. Because we had left her, her life, or we had lost contact with her when she was living in very risky circumstances. Thank God you're alive. How are you doing? What have you been doing? She was carrying scars and marks. And basically her story was that she'd spent the majority of time since we had contact with her in and out of prison. And she was awaiting another sentence because she had a whole heap of other charges. Now she was still vibrant. She was still a resilient person. She was still potential that we just hadn't tapped into. And I think of Angie, and I think of Angie when I'm speaking to you tonight, that you know the Angies of this world. And you know the kind of things that we should be doing better to improve on the outcomes for our most vulnerable children. And that's what I'm looking for in terms of the work that I'm doing, in terms of the work that you're doing. Because if we all push together in the right direction, in the same direction, then we can change very many things. And it's with that thought that I want to leave you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Alan Staff. I'm Chief Executive of Apex. Um, we have a, a short period of time where uh, I know Tam is, is willing to take any questions that you might have. Can I ask you to um, wait until the microphone arrives and then if you can uh, just uh, introduce yourself and make your question as succinct as we can and that will give as much time as possible for everyone to get their burning questions uh, off their chest and not to go away feeling uh, uh, dissatisfied. There is opportunity to continue the discussion through the back at the reception uh, on the completion of this, uh, this session. So uh, we'll take any questions you might have. Hello, Bernadette Monaghan, <laughs> National Convener of Children's Hearing Scotland. Tom, thank you very much for that. It's always a pleasure to hear you. And um, as you know, I share your views about the fact that I do think we can keep older teenagers within the hearing system for longer. I represent a lot of panel members out there who 
give up their time to train, to sit on hearings, and who actually deal with the individual young person who's sitting in front of them, and they want to make things a little bit better for that young person. So I take your point about evidence of the impact of the children's hearing system. I suppose I feel I need to say that, as you know, for panel members, they are the decision makers. They want those decisions to be taken seriously and to be implemented. Just in terms of um, older teenagers, when we had the youth courts, there were a lot of specialist resources that backed up the youth courts, and young people could access all those services through the children's hearings. They didn't need to go to a youth court, in, in my view. I just wonder what your view is about what kind of resources and services. We've heard something this evening about the work that Apex has pioneered in the inclusion unit. Um, we're at a time when the voluntary sector is being squeezed very tightly, as, as you know. Um, but what kind of resources do you think we need to have built into the hearing system if we are seriously going to offer appropriate support to 16, 17 year olds? Yeah, okay. One of the advantages that youth courts had, as you said, was resources, but it also had speed of response. It could tap into additional supports for children and young people. I don't think it's rocket science in terms of the support that's required for our children. Of that age, they need employment. They need, they need a stake in the world. They also need stable accommodation. And by stable accommodation, I'm talking about those children that are in care, but also those who are living in the community. And they need somebody important in their lives that will be their stable presence right the way through. It's the same as the kind of things that count for children in the early years. Things that will make uh, and I, I actually think, I mean, there's lots of talk about whether we should be focusing on criminal behaviour or diversionary activities. I think it's a mixture. But you need people that have got time. And I should have said one of the key differences, of course, with England and Scotland is the lay tribunal, the lay members who are the absolute backbone of the work that's, that, that's done in the hearing system. But we know the kind of elements that will support young people. It's just that we need to have them on tap. And if we're serious about trying to, t trying to get and trying to turn around young people's lives because it will cause grief later on if we don't, then we have to be prepared to invest in that. And I would say that right away through the system, not just about our 16 to 21 year olds, which is my preoccupation just now. You know, it really struck me when I was in Pullman and Cottonvale, just about that forest of hands. I can't, I can't say that enough. Do you know? I, I, of course, I knew that a lot of them would be in care, but I, it just struck me that this is where our most vulnerable children are ending up. So it's better to invest there than allow uh, to do it elsewhere. But that's not, that's, that's, that, that's not a radical message. <laughs> you know, you in this room know that. Um, Sandra Brown from the Moira Anderson Foundation. Uh, we support those affected by child sexual abuse. And I was just thinking, you know, while I applaud your, 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 your um, mention of the fact that the care system could do so much better and keep children longer and support them longer before we send them on their way. Nevertheless, I spoke to an Angie today whom, whom we've supported. Um, she was probably around in the 80s when you were in Glasgow. Um, and that Eileen, uh, that's her name, she was abused in every single care home she was in. It didn't make any difference whether it was local authority, Church of Scotland or whatever. It, it was no respecter of, of, of that at all. She is a survivor in the sense that Mainstream have recently published her, um, her second book about being in care and it was actually launched at the Edinburgh Book Festival a couple of weeks ago. But what strikes me is what pressure can you bear can you bring to bear Tam on those who are dealing with the training of carers those going into care settings I know a lot has happened and there's been a momentum since the early you know the 68 social work act and Lord Clyde and all the rest of the 90s but what can you say to assure me given that uh, you know, as well as your big blether, there's also been recently um, time to be heard. Tom Shaw's review. Yeah. 
looking at the voices of survivors from way, way back, and I'm not just talking about the 80s, but way back, you know, you'll know about Sue Moody's work, you know, the, the, the okay. six, 50s, 60s, right on. But what, as I say, what can you tell me that I can pass on to this Angie, who's come through that system, and that what's happening about carers and their training so that that won't happen to more folk in the future? Thank okay. you. I too have worked with the children who've been abused and abused in care and had to pick up the pieces on some of those children. And you can never give 100% assurances about the care of any child, but I do have confidence of the time, effort and diligence that we put into our inspection regimes in one uh, respect and also in the training and the checks that are now in place for our childcare staff. But you can never have 100% assurances, but I do think that we have reasonably tight systems there to pick up on what were terrible abuses that happened too frequently in the past. And we are, I think the system is trying as much as it can to guard against any of those future abuses in future. So there's all sorts of structures that are now in place that wouldn't have been there previously. And we're just in the process of reshaping our inspection regimes to try and make them more effective and have that capacity to ensure that the standards are there in the first place, which will help reduce the chances of further abuses for children who are looked after. Thanks. Um, Malcolm Hutchinson. Robert Owen Institute. Tam, it's been illuminating listening to you um, and I wish you well in this country to do what you set out as your aims and objectives. Um, I'd like to carry on from where the last person spoke because I've been working with a young lad for a few years who we as a society uh, spent £457,000 on over 12 years of his life. He went into the care system as a young smoker at seven, he came out as a drug addict who'd been physically and psychologically abused for years. Uh, eventually came out of Peterhead and Sockton as not just a drug addict, but a drug dealer. And that's the product of our care system, our child hearing system, and our government systems, which have yet to understand what words that you've used, whole systems, outcomes, it's fine words, but how do you really think this country will take the real meaning of what whole systems approaches, early intervention and preventative spend mean? Okay, uh, let me say two things. I've been talking about the here and now, the here and now of the children who are already in our system. But if I'm going to be absolutely honest, I think our salvation in terms of generational change is right in the earliest years of children's lives. I didn't go on about it tonight, it's another speech, but actually the evidence is there that we should be intervening at absolutely the earliest stages from pregnancy through to year three. And there's all of the evidence in terms of brain development, cognitive development, social development, mental development of our children. But it's not just about our children. It's about parents' capacity and ability to actually nurture that child. And there are a whole raft of things that I think that we should be doing in terms of early years development. Some of those are about parental support and we shouldn't be squeamish about providing for parental support. Not in the, the, the knee-jerk reaction to the riots to say parents need to be disciplined in terms of their, their approach to children, but to be genuinely assisted in those tenderest, earliest years of children's lives. We should be looking at uh, early, uh, early year centres that go through not to five that provide that stability of support, most often in our poorest communities. And we should actually be looking at how we build in some of our universal services, particularly our midwifery and health visiting services, which are our non-stigmatising services to our youngest, tenderest families. So I'm not skipping the challenge in terms of providing better care for children and young people, but if we're genuine about a generational change, then I think the early years is where we should be targeting our time, energy and resources. Is that helpful? Annie Safeguarders Association. Um, I've had many years within the children's hearing system, uh, nearly 30 years, and one of my big concerns was that we were very much a reactive system and not proactive. 
and talking about um, the, the, the children of the, the 16, 17 year olds, one of my concerns was that I discussed many times with Glasgow Social Work Department was to have to provide security for children rather than secure accommodation and that security being rather than a child going into a crisis situation that they would know that there was somewhere to provide them security to go to at 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, whatever. And I think that we've missed the boat several times with new legislation and certainly with what, you know, different governments. What are your views on having something like that? Maybe similar to the drop-in centre that you were talking about? Um, we had refuge as part of uh, the 95 Act, didn't resource it. Uh, I think one of the key things is how our services are, I'm way off message here just now, so I'm just answering, but one of the key things is how our services are constructed. 95, whereas we know that our families are vulnerable families, you don't get, the problems don't arise between 95 Monday to Friday. You just need to look at our emergency duty teams. Our emergency duty teams take in about one in three children into care in those crisis situations that you're talking about. So if we're going to be reshaping services, let's reshape them around the times that actually our families uh, require some of that support. And it's not necessarily in those office hours. And it's a real challenge. Uh, and I know that some organisations are trying to match that challenge through different working practices. But until we get to that stage, then we will always have a gap when the crisis arrives. And we know that it's a Friday night when there's too much drink around or whatever. Uh, in fact, the police pick up lots and lots of, uh, because they're a 24-7 uh, service, they pick up lots and lots of that intervention, that support that could and should, in my view, be offered in other ways. We've just got time to take a couple more. Can I just ask that we just take a, a couple of, of very quick questions, um, take them consecutively, and then uh, Sam can respond to them together. Quite an <laughs> <laughs> Esther Robertson, thanks, Tam. Uh, I'm Chair of Sacro and a relative newcomer to the criminal justice world, having had some time with Apex and now with Sacro. I had real optimism when I became involved. Um, once I got over the naivety of thinking we already had a whole systems approach and that everything would be fine. Um, but we have had the McLeish report. And more recently, we've had Susan Deacon's report yep. on the early years that you've referred to. And both of those reports seem to say we need to stop looking for evidence and we need to get on and do, because the evidence in some of those areas, at least, is there. Do you think there is more this kind of audience needs to be doing with five years of majority government ahead of us and a sense of a political will to get this whole subject back properly on the agenda? Yes. And I want the government, I want us to think ambitiously. We've got an opportunity. I sense that people I, I, I want positive change. One of the things which I'm playing, if you like, that I, I said earlier, which I come back to, is about the value that we place in children and young people. And I'll do everything that I can to try and shift our value base in terms of our children and young people. And I think that with that shift, we'll follow a whole host of things about how we treat our children better. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, I was part of uh, trying to encourage the government to uh, do more, I mean the UK government, about child poverty. And about three or four years ago, Joseph Rowntree produced a report which said to get the child poverty figures back on track will cost £3 billion. And we, in our lobbying uh, organisations, thought £3 billion. How can we get that message across? That's an enormous sum of money. And we started doing things like Googling how much do we spend in champagne to find that it was more than three billion, so we, we would use that as a hook. And then the financial crisis came along. And the financial crisis came along, and the bailout for that was 150 billion pounds. And that made me think that actually the move on child poverty, or the lack of movement in child poverty, was about lack of priority, lack of value in actually making that happen because we made the 150 billion happen. I know we're all paying a price for it just now. I often thought about writing an article saying, why don't we make 153 billion? 
and we can at least get a, re a real outcome on it. But it's about the value that we place in children and young people, the priority. And I sense that children and young people can become a higher priority so that we don't have an interminable debate about whether the resource is worth spending or not. Because for me it is, and in fact we can't afford not to. I'm going to put, just take the one more. Hi, uh, Stuart Bain, Fife Council Human Resources. Tam, you mentioned earlier about um, the benefits of getting young people into employment. Yep. I wondered if you had any words of advice to employers and, and how they can um, help young people overcome some of the barriers that they might face in getting into employment and some of the stereotypes or prejudices that employers might have about young people. Yeah, and some of those stereotypes, some of those gaps in the market are real, actually you know, about uh, the young people's confidence uh, and personability, it's particularly getting into the uh, um, service industries right, where they're, they're dealing with the public. But I spent some, I've been around a little bit, so I can give an example of just about every piece of work, but I, I learned a lot when I was uh, um, setting up a unit to try and get young people from care and who are homeless into employment. And reason, I, the, where, I, where I did my learning was from the world of disability. The world of disability that had an understanding about how you bridge that gap between the demands of the employment market and the, what people were bringing to that job. And they provided lots of support, lots of coaching, lots of sensitivity on the employer side to make sure that the people that they were working with actually got meaningful employment that lasted and was sustainable. And we might have to take some of those approaches in terms of uh, employment for some of our most vulnerable young people. And we're in danger of losing a generation just now because of the market that they're having to compete in with people who genuinely got qualifications and experience. I'll just give you an example in my office. Uh, we went through a series, we don't have, we went through a series of people who were temping for an admin post. The post which was uh, um, least paid in the office. And we had a series of PhD doctors come in and do our admin. That's where we were at. In fact, and it sounds shames me, we should have had a young person doing that. But so it, it, the, the, uh, there's, there's a, a great disadvantage for children young, or for young people just now in the jobs market. But for the most vulnerable ones, we can bridge the gap. And actually, for many of our children, we just need to actually trust in their capacity and ability because that's all they need to blossom. I spend a long time answering these questions, don't I? Don't, uh... <laughs> Sorry. Okay, well, um, have you... can oh, you make more? it really quick? I promise uh, we okay. must Shall I speak finish. really quickly or give a really... Speak really quickly. Quick. Give, me an, easy, really give quickly. me an easy question. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Marina. I work with Circle, I'm manager of the families affected by an imprisonment team. And one of the things that we're, when we're talking about particularly vulnerable children, the most particularly vulnerable children I'm aware of are the children of prisoners. Mm -hmm. And so often when I work with whole families, and that's what we work with, uh, as I say, complete families, their parents and very often their grandparents were actually in the prison system. And in actual fact, Kenny McCaskill recently made an announcement saying that half the children, prisoners, in actual fact, end up in prison themselves. Now, by and large, one of the statements I could make is they're the most disenfranchised group of people that I know. And what do you think of the statements to, that are getting bandied around this week about the feral underclass? Let's just push them further away then. And it's what can we do about that? Okay. okay. Two things on that, Marina. You know that children of prisoners are close to my heart in terms of high, producing reports and highlighting some of the additional considerations that we could do to... Um, have a better appreciation and try and look at how we might take that into account for me at point of sentencing of those uh, parents or carers and in fact we did we produced an update report recently on that and in fact there will be a I've, I've asked I, I think we'll get an inquiry uh, through Parliament looking at that whole issue um, of children of prisoners but the comments about feral youth I've, I've, I've given it life by just repeating it there. I didn't mean to do that. But that's what I was getting at about the response that children gave to, or young people gave to us 
when they said in their communities they wanted to feel safe and respected. And I'm going to go down the angle of respect to try and counter the negative stereotyping of children and young people and to pr be promoting greater respect for our children and young people. And it all ties in with that value base that I was talking about. I mean, these are, um, these are ambitious uh, uh, um, objectives. But I only get one shot at this job and I'm going to try and make the best of it. And I know that I've got to work through other people, but I'll do as much as I can to actually push those really tough, difficult agendas, because those are the ones I think that will count in the longer term for how we deal with our children and young people. Thank you. I'm just going to call on uh, Chief Constable David Strang, one of Apex uh, board members, to close the formal part of this evening. Thanks very much indeed, and uh, it's my pleasure just to sum up very briefly uh, some of our discussion tonight and then to say uh, a word or two uh, of thanks. Tam has raised some hugely important uh, issues for us, and as we know, there are questions about the criminal justice system uh, in England that we've just been touched on, and, and in Scotland, and interestingly, Audit Scotland's uh, overview of the criminal justice system published today. And I think there's, a, there's an absolute consensus on the need for early intervention, that whole prevention agenda that makes so much sense and is a real challenge for us to deliver, and uh, Tam's emphasis on early years as a starting point. Uh, I think the second area that, that he highlighted for me was, was that whole issue of transitions, that movement from care uh, and what happens beyond 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, um, transition of justice from a, from a, 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 a care setting to a, an adult criminal justice system, and uh, a transition from uh, education uh, to employment, that, that whole difficulty of uh, growing up from 15 to 25. Um, and I think the, the real challenge uh, that Tam has set out for us is um, what is the impact that we have on the lives of young people. I thought coming through very clearly is that um, sense of valuing children and young people, respecting them. And I think a real challenge to us all was about uh, what is the real uh, impact that we have. Um, I was delighted that um, three young people, Chloe Dean and Connor from uh, the Fernland High School spoke at, at the beginning or, or are here um, and Chloe spoke at the beginning about the work of Apex uh, Scotland working uh, with young people in, in Dunfermline and across the country. And of course our uh, uh, whole purpose is about supporting uh, young people and uh, helping them to deliver positive outcomes for their lives. So on to a word or two uh, of thanks uh, from me on behalf of the Apex Scotland uh, board. Um, uh, I know for some of uh, you I was speaking to earlier, this is the first time that you've been in uh, the Signet Library, this uh, magnificent setting. Uh, and so our thanks go to uh, the Signet Library for uh, their allowing us to use this. And there is a, a reception following, uh, and our thanks to Ben LaRue and staff from Heritage Portfolio. Um, our sound engineers are Blue Lizard Media and uh, Alan Shedlock, who's clicking away there um, with his uh, camera. Uh, our thanks again to our sponsors, Mega Nexus Secure Data Partnerships, who have uh, worked very closely with us and, and made a real difference to what uh, we are doing. An evening like this doesn't happen without a great deal of organisation, and thanks to Lynn, Sarah and William uh, from uh, Apex Head Office. Uh, special thanks to um, Chloe, Connor and Dean from Dunfermline High School. They are going to be around afterwards, and can I encourage you to... Uh, speak to them here more about uh, the work of the in inclusion unit there. They're all smiling at me, so uh, I know that they'll be happy to answer your questions. Um, and of course, uh, a, a huge thank you to our speaker this evening, uh, Tam Bailey, of Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People. Uh, Tam, I think what has come across this evening is your real passion um, for improving the lives of, of children and young people. You speak. Uh, with authority because you speak from your experience, you bring real uh, insight uh, and I think you have laid out uh, compelling arguments that have really challenged how we do it, uh, things at the moment and how we can improve uh, uh, Scotland for our children and young people. 
And my last and perhaps most important thank you is to all of you uh, for attending uh, here this evening. Uh, I know it's been uh, a fascinating evening. There's been uh, real insight and challenge. So thank you very much indeed for your attendance and for your uh, support of Apex Scotland. Um, and I now invite you to, to come through behind me to where the refreshments are. But uh, if I can just finally close uh, by once again thanking Tam Bailey and asking you to join me in thanking him.